Katie LaFalcher, welcome back to Irish Granny Tarot and our Saturday book, The Convoluted Universe, book five, last in the series by Dolores Cannon. And this is video number four, two last week, and now we're on our second of the day, number four. We're starting chapter 19, A Creator Light Being. So Cannon was moving around traveling for lectures and she was in Los Angeles and she was at a hotel uh, at LAX and her subject's name is Trevor and in uh, in his trance he's looking at a huge steaming volcano with a jungle at the base and he sees lots of giant palm trees palm leaves he's wearing a one-piece white space suit with boots connected to it he's a male with a long black braid and whitish blue skin He's got two fingers and a thumb on each hand, and they're webbed. He has angular, long, narrow, pointed face, a nose and a mouth, and pointed ears, large eyes. He's wearing a glass bubble helmet that he can see out of. And he is a visitor from the future, observing a prehistoric environment. Time traveler. And he just appeared here. He said he sort of beamed himself down with his own thoughts. So he's just there to enjoy the scene and he can leave just by becoming a light vortex. He just spin on out and his suit is a precaution because of the environment. He says he's really just a light source himself. He says the place he's leaving has two moons. Well, that he left from, sort of like the earth before the continents split apart. So I don't know what that means. He's going to uh, clear, uh, going to a clear dome structure that's futuristic and massive. He goes through it and lands in a futuristic room and has a body again, but he has no need for the suit because he's indoors. He realizes he's in his apartment with a window view of the city, and he realizes he works from home, does a lot of Zoom meetings. <laughs> his desk has a holographic schematics on it, and with a wave of his hand, uh, he can operate it like a musical instrument, like a theremin, you know, those weird, eerie-sounding instruments. This is before a lot of things like touch screens and iPhones and stuff. Uh, really interesting how it sort of predicts what's going to come up. So this thing makes sounds, and he can move symbols and charts around by moving his hands above it. And every time he moves it, there's a musical tone. He's able to form a pattern. And to travel to the next place, he's um, constructing the next place. He's going to a location. He's going to construct it with his own thoughts. He's building a planet to travel through. That's what this whole holographic map thing is. He's able to create. And once he makes it, he can get it to rotate and spin out of the room through the dome and he does too. He says, I become light again and I follow it quickly and it grows and gets the size of a planet and goes into the universe. I give it light with my light in, uh, it's like a ball. He said this particular one is like a ball of ocean only, but he can walk along the bottom of the ocean. He says he makes these things, creates them, sends them off, goes to them and enjoys them, and then he can leave whenever he wants to and go back and do it again. And as he walks, he says, on the floor of the ocean, things grow like sea plants and coral and fish. Some are solid. Some are more of an electrical outline of something solid. And then he's off again. This is intuitive for him. He says this planet with the dome that he lives in is not really his home. It's the base of operation. He says he's 100% happy creating and traveling. She moves him to his next life, and he's a teacher and an advisor to the Egyptian pharaoh. This was the first of many lives, the first uh, commitment that he made to an entire life cycle on earth. And he remembers this time uh, 
and the lesson he le learned was you don't always lose your abilities. You can keep them. Um, next, Canon has a woman who's, uh, oh, yeah, I think this is somebody new. No, <laughs> you'll understand here in a second. The subject's a woman. In her session, she sees a void with purple orbs talking to each other, giving off light from inside the orbs. She's not allowed to travel beyond a certain part, a point. It's uh, part of a collective of beings that she belongs to inside these orbs. And then I wrote, and this is funny, this description is too confusing and disjointed to summarize. So you can get the book and figure out what on earth they were talking about. It's just stream of consciousness, disjointed, and really hard to understand. Because what Cannon did is record verbatim what people experienced in their hypnotic session. And sometimes the people didn't know what they were experiencing or looking at or what they were. This is not like, oh, I'm, I'm, you know, a knight of the round table and I'm Sir Galahad. This is a whole different kind of regression. So then we have Jennifer who sees herself in a simple Native American life as a man, an observer on the open plains. And one day a group of settlers comes through and uh, he's curious and Cannon moves him ahead into a little bit of a future and he's in a futuristic city with unusual buildings and unusual crafts in the sky. He's uh, tall, thin, androgynous with long hands and no hair and big eyes, wearing a one-piece suit with an emblem on the shoulder he said that the emblem, in, in trance, he says, this emblem looks familiar to me. Why? From a dream? I don't know. And he says, I know I'm a navigator on a craft. He has a mission and he knows where to go. And he'll return for short breaks on a craft. And then he'll go and explore and return and bring back information. He says, when he gets to where he needs to present the information he lies on a bed and it taps into the information in him directly he can go wherever he wants and then he learns and brings his learning back he can go anytime any place he can create it he can explore it and he can bring the information back it's like having a browsing library of the universe the craft is the headquarters of where he brings the information and the body of the being stays while the spirit beams aboard. No, it's the other way around. The body of the um, being stays on the ship and the uh, spirit goes on a beam exploring. And the body stays in suspended animation. The spirit returns to the craft and downloads this body on a bed, downloads the information. And this spirit came as Jennifer, the woman in... Uh, a trance for the experience of emotions and to put drama in perspective. Um, karma is not part of this person's life plan in this kind of a life for whatever reason it's a certain kind of learning and uh, it doesn't include accruing karma. People who still want to learn uh, opt to get trapped in karma because they want to stay here for the lessons. So when you don't need it anymore, you leave the cycle of repeated karma and go beyond it. Because of the new, well, not needing it anymore means you've learned what you need to learn. You've balanced out your situation and you can move on. And because of the new earth, karma is gone now. Oh, I forgot I read that. Hmm. People who look like they are doing things with karma are stuck in a habit. I, I put I, in the margin here, I wrote, huh? Um, what she was told was that in the past, karma's balance changed as you did, did good things and you hurt people. You know, the balance was back and forth until you managed to figure out how to keep it stable and you were good and you learned your lessons and then you didn't need to reincarnate well now karma is not being accrued 
but behaviors are the same. Hurting people, being good, love, damage. It, it, there's, and it looks like karma is being accrued. But they're stuck in the habit of the behaviors. And we're not, we're beyond that now, I guess, because of the shift, the paradigm shift. People are still dealing with the residue, cause and effect, but eventually they're going to look at the bigger picture and, and realize to themselves, what am I doing? I want out. And when you get to that point, it means you've grown. You've successfully rectified it. Uh, we all get stuck in emotions and stuff and as she says to Canon, it's the game. So it's okay to choose an emotional roller coaster or an obsessive roller coaster and work things out. There's a lesson to be had. Chapter 20, Go Be Light. Melanie, in trance, emerges into nothing. And in her work, Cannon says she sees more subtle changes, especially in the past 10 years. So she died in 2014. So since 2004, between 2004 and 2014, there was the end of all those past life regressions where you went back to the Wild West or the Middle Ages or prehistoric times. Now, people's experience is very odd, not going into past lives. And she says to figure out what on earth is going on, she has to ask 20 questions. It's really hard. And this woman, Melanie, says, I see only dark and then wisps of light that become milky and then get bigger. And then uh, I'm in it, very still and bright. I am light. I am part of the light. And then this entity says, be the light by showing people how to stand in the light. Speak up. The message is we all have endless power. Melanie is, according to Canon, a second wave observer, an innocent soul who's not familiar with life on the earth and is simply here as the bearer of light. We haven't done the books by Canon about the three waves of people and we'll eventually get to that. Uh, did all her books out of order. I just, you know, what did I know? Chapter 21, The Motherboard. A subject named Francis is in the middle of a rainforest. There are fairies and divas all around, uh, tall trees, streams. She's on a patch of land. There are little creatures in the trees with wings like crystal that are made of glass that shine, but they don't break, and the numbers of them vary. There's a lot of rain. Francis is on a chair with a tarp over and uh, many birds with bright colors are flying around and she can see a whole lot of stars in the sky. She's a woman around 30 with blonde hair in a print dress. She went back and forth to home. In, she's not in her home. She's in a little seclusion area. She takes a little boat that she sails or paddles to get back home, but she came to watch the fairies and she came often to watch the fairies. Uh, they live in small straw. Let's see, I'm trying to understand here what I wrote. Okay, she had built a small straw bamboo, uh, bamboo straw hut with just enough room to sleep in, and she made basket weaving and bead work. She played music on a flute and a big drum. She said she belonged to a village of huts but she lived separately in this more um, temporary kind of hut. Uh, the creatures of the forest were her family. The villagers tolerated her. They didn't see the fairies. They thought she was a little, you know. Uh, Cannon moves her to a future time and she reports that invaders killed all the villagers with canoes. They came in canoes, they killed them with guns, they stole everything and they ended the peace. She hides on this island where she's safe. She heard screaming. She didn't go to see what was going on. She said she went back much later when it got quiet and saw everything burned, taken, people killed. She says, the fairies take care of me. The plants are our food and I don't need much. She communicates telepathically with the fairies and never feels alone. 
But eventually the invaders find her and kill her. She says, I was old. So to them, she seemed like she was a savage. They didn't care. The lesson is there's more to life than meets the eye and nature is the best teacher. She returns to the light and uh, knows, meets up with these beings of light who are very tall. Um, they're busy doing something important, but she's very tired because she was living outdoors and it was uh, a lot of wear and tear physically. So she's recuperating spiritually. She eventually gets a new job. Uh, she's now a military business-like guy who has orders to follow and is being helped to recover by beings that look like sparks. Um, she's been given liquid light to drink and feels a real influx of energy and feels much better. So eventually she has enough energy to go back and she's very tall and works with these tall beings that she first saw in the light that we just mentioned. Everybody knows her. Uh, she works on a motherboard. Everybody has a motherboard that drives everything and it includes many different currents. It's an overlay of the body. We, she says we fix it with our um, thoughts and this electric overlay comes from DNA and it's projected out as an energy field. And there's a different program for everybody. Uh, each person's basic plan determined by your DNA and it's projected as an energy field around you. And that would coincide with the belief that uh, physicists have now that we each have an electromagnetic field around us and there's light in DNA. So uh, we can use the field to connect with higher dimensions and with other beings. And most people are not aware of this, uh, but we can communicate through light and sound. If there's a leak in your field, the person gets sick. It's like a short circuit. It has to be uh, tuned to be healed with light and sound. Sometimes you can fix yourself, and it depends on how bad the damage is, the quality of the circuits, and the ability of the person. Uh, how body mass is determined on this template uh, just sort of depends and once there's a leak things start to backfire and it will affect your thinking and your beliefs it's like your energy field is punctured or something uh, sound and light create a vacuum to seal the leak it's like fixing a punctured balloon it's the physics of how light operates canon is told this is physics there's nothing mysterious about it we just don't understand it yet these beings help to do the work they get a message from a computer which checks everyone automatically and they, they get instructions to fix the body, to work on the program, and it's different for each one. Each problem requires a different department to fix it. That sounds familiar. Uh, sometimes they have to replace things. Sometimes they have to change uh, a frequency. Sometimes it can't be fixed. Sometimes it's not supposed to be fixed uh, because whatever's wrong contains lessons to be learned, karma. Some don't want to be fixed because the leak has a negative effect on how they think. So this operates from an elect electrical signal in your heart and when you operate uh, from head, from your head, when you operate your life from your head, you're operating on a low level. When you operate from your heart, you're operating on a higher level. So what you want to be saying is, I love you so much with all my heart and not, I love you so much with all my head. <laughs> so you need to be aware of your heart chakra and you need to breathe through your heart. And uh, for the sake of YouTube, I'm not giving medical advice. This is, uh, we'll call it the mythology that's being... Um, expressed in this hypnotic trance from this book. It's not medical advice. So you need to breathe from your heart and you can heal anything, she says. It's a quantum space and you can believe with all your heart. 
Love is who you are. Canon is told this is what her work accesses. She heals the physical in sessions, and uh, I don't usually read to you the process of her healing sessions because actually it's kind of boring you know uh, it doesn't really reveal any new ideas it's just a description of her manipulating people's legs or whatever you know it's kind of boring but it, she's using this process of energy healing and she's told that before there's light there's sound we're talking frequencies of vibration she's told keep your heart open and stay connected so the subconscious is source energy the holy spirit or the life force energies, which you can call it. Because Kenan was asking in this session, do you mind if I tell people I'm accessing the subconscious? And they say, you can call that. What you're accessing is source energy or the Holy Spirit or life force energy. The first thing that is built embryonically, fetally, is the heart. You start out with a little single cell electrical impulse. And you're not dead till your heart stops. Theoretically. Chapter 22, an entire universe shifts. The subject's name is Celeste, and she is um, driving in space, driving a ship with her mind. She is energy. She's not a body. She says she feels like she's male energy. There is a form of a UFO, but it's not real inside and outside, uh, she can see through the whole thing. She can see space through the floor and the walls. She says, I'm a ball of white energy. I'm very free. She's headed towards the Milky Way and has a heart center with energy. Um, and there's, she says that there is a heart center to the Milky Way with energy, that the galaxy is alive with love. She's basking in the love. The whole galaxy is moving in this love. She said she and others helped form the galaxy with their thoughts. The galaxy is in the middle of a big change. It's moving to another level. And everyone here will move too. Hopefully. So there are some on the earth that don't know that everything's going to move. And some won't move. And they'll be sad. It's happening now because it's time. These things happen in cycles. Uh, they're like earth cycles. Nothing stays the same. Uh, there's just different levels of energy is what we're talking about, that we're ready to realize we're all part of the light. We'll discover what it is and that we're part of it. We're all part of one. We will realize that we're bigger and have no limitations. Some people will not wake up because they're too focused on themselves. They're focused on a routine and control, and they really don't know who they are. They won't be with us, she says. The other galaxy will be for them. Consciousness, galaxy, universe, people, earth, all moving. And we all need to be on a similar level of vibration. Uh, there should not be a separation. There should not be different levels of vibration. And right now that's the problem, that dissonance. The earth is imp an important planet. It's a planet of energy. And she came to help with that. She says incarnating is very restricting and very confined if you're in a body. It, it's dark. There's fear. You cry. Everything's a drama. She says in other existences, they don't have this stuff. They don't have these emotions and it's not heavy and dark like that. She said fear on earth is by far the worst part. If we kept our memories of past lives, we could not stay here because we would not be able to attach to our body. Our body is not enough for us to be able to use our real power. We don't use all of our energy and it's a good thing that we don't because really our energy is too much for the body and it might, you know, might flame out. Our energy is bigger than the galaxy. We're moving from small to big. She says these energy entities all un are undercover and they try to do it. We try to do this by ourselves and not be dependent. Um, what she's talking about is the help is there. We don't need to be alone. We don't need to feel alone. We need to tap into the help. They're trying to do it for us, but we need to work with them.
We have free will and we have to do it for ourselves. Celeste struggles with her role of energy healer for the earth. And she is also someone who had miscarriages because of the energy level of her body. Her body was too high. So that that's actually the end of the book. It kind of ends abruptly. And then Julia, her daughter, is the one who collated this and said um, at the end that she put as much as she could get together of her mother's work um, into this and organized it as best she could and that yes there will be more books they're in various stages of completion and they were before her mother died so there's a matter of organizing them and um, editing them and publishing them so we have to keep our eyes open for more books coming out sorry this is a little shorter i suppose we could do a card reading let's do a card reading um, I actually wasn't completely prepared to do a card reading, so I don't have a, a question yet, but I'll delay here for time while I hunt for my cards, and we'll come up with a question. I'm going to use the mag uh, Mystical Tarot of the Saints, this beautiful deck from Nate, who uh, we're going to get together again soon and talk. It won't be long. And I need to pay better attention to the saints. I get all caught up in the um, the tarot part of it, and I've been ignoring the saints. And then I've got another deck that I pulled out the other day, the Golden Tarot, which is medieval and early Renaissance paintings. I got this on Amazon a while back, I think. I have a hard time finding tarot cards that resonate for me. Apparently I like art. <laughs> okay, let's ask the cards. Let's ask the cards about the backdrop people. It's very interesting that they're not doomed to be nothing forever. That the more interaction they get, the more real they become it's like you know pinocchio <laughs> let's uh let's do a full reading on them and let's ask about the people who are angry and mired in that and don't want to change and want everybody else to be like them and have these values of greed and ego and material accumulation and vengeance and anger. Let's ask. Let's just do a full card reading on them and just see what the cards say in general. Let me make some space. Okay. To really study the cards because they're new you know and I'm not entirely immediately familiar with what I'm looking at so we get at the heart of this um, the Queen of Swords Joan of Arc and uh, Joan of Arc was a political figure you know who fought alongside the uh, the Dauphin who was supposed to be claiming the throne of France, if I, if I remember correctly, and ended up, uh, you know, being martyred and crossed by the Two of Swords. So what this is saying is allegiance to truth, allegiance to light, allegiance to justice is a free will choice. And you may follow the path that you think is the path of light and it may or may not end well for you and the trick is to be able to discern the correct path and always the choice is to follow uh, 
love for other people. And this is the atmosphere above all of this. This is sort of a, a comment to the people who are the backdrop people, who are angry, who are upset. This is strength. And the saint here is Saint Martha. And Saint Martha is known for slaying the dragon. But there's also another Saint Martha who was a sister of Mary and Martha who were two women in the periphery of Jesus's life. And Martha, as we all know now from The Handmaid's Tale, Martha was the one who always hung back and worked in the kitchen. And she was kind of angry that her sister was always worshiping at Jesus's feet and listening to what he had to say. And she was busy running around doing the dishes and making the food and stuff. And I always felt sorry for Martha personally. Uh, it must be nice to be able to hang out and philosophize when there's dinner to make. But I think strength comes from serving, serving others. Strength comes from love and doing acts of service. I think that's the message of that card. And at the foundation... We get the Three of Swords. So if you don't live a life of service to others and find your strength, you doom yourself to grief and sorrow. And we have the Four of Swords reversed as uh, the past. If you... Uh, choose to be contentious and angry and hostile and fighting and, and all these other uh, negative sorts of emotions and you reject the idea of truth. You reject the idea of justice for everybody. This is going to force you into uh, a situation of unhappiness and apathy and, and uh resentment and being disgruntled and having to sort of withdraw from the larger brotherhood of man, if I can use a very gendered term. And moving forward, staying in your strength, doing service to others, choosing the light and the truth, you get the 10, yes, <laughs> the 10 of staffs, the Ten of Wands, which is uh, coming to the end of shouldering a burden. If you're working in a group and you're working with uh, a sense of compassion for others and out of love for others, uh, the burden is shared and it no longer remains a terrible burden. And this is interesting. The Nine of Staffs, the Nine of... Um, wands basically so this process of learning to act out of compassion and help others and find your strength in the truth choose truth choose justice be a justice warrior is what this is saying fight for the right for justice for truth fight for that be strong about that. And in the environment that you're living in, if, if you're picking up these actions and doing these actions in the larger world, it's going to spread. So St. Francis, this is the world, St. Francis is the patron saint of, you know, animals. And he was a real hippie saint. Everybody loved him in the 60s. Father, what was it? Brother, son, sister, moon. Uh, but he had compassion about the environment, compassion about animals, you know, the more vulnerable creatures of the earth. And uh, that's the goal, is to get everybody concerned about each other and the greater well-being of the planet and everything on it. And we have this opportunity, and the opportunity is based in free will. We have a choice. We can make a choice. And if we make the right choice, we can bring the whole entire world into this existence of love for each other and cooperation and compassion. 
Now, this is interesting. But it's going to require, now this is going to look shocking, but I don't think it's quite as shocking as it appears on first glance. We get the four of staffs, the four of wands reversed, crossed by death reversed. So we have a golden opportunity here. And what is that opportunity for? Changing our institutions, changing the way we do things, changing our traditions, change. And not all change is bad. Not all status quo is good. We have not functioned on the right level of concern for a very long time. And for the earth to evolve, we have to change. We have to evolve. And we have to evolve the way we do everything. And we have the opportunity to do that and fall into an existence of compassion for each other and change the world to the kind of existence that St. Francis would recognize as a good existence. So let's do, I'm going to make sure I put this in the right place. Let's do a clarifier on that. That outcome of changing our basic way of doing things, our status quo, our traditions, away from capitalism and greed and materialism and lack of empathy, away from all of that, make the big change. And so my clarifier is, how likely is that? Is that going to happen? see we've just about reached our limit the ten of swords we're just about at the limit of uh how horrible we can be to each other and how much we can suffer the earth has reached its limit and we've kind of reached our limit it's time for a paradigm shift we're at the end it's time for healing the king of cups the king of cups is about compassionate leadership concern for each other, moving into uh, an environment of love and caring and wisdom and fairness. The King of Cups is it's a good card to get. And so this is our choice. Okay, we're, we're at a, the end of a paradigm. Just about done as much negative as we can possibly do. So... We have that two of swords that we drew. We have that choice to make. And if we make the right choice, we end up in an environment that's, you know, it's idyllic. It's an environment of love. Or the three of swords, which is suffering and pain and a lack of healing. And the message, I believe, in these cards is that uh, the people who are mired in um, fantasies of revenge and feelings of anger and wanting stuff, materialism, greed, you know, the way everything seems to be going, that those people, all of us, are being faced with a choice. And it's up to them. It's not up to us to worry about their choice. It's up to us to worry about our choice. If we make the right choice, then we will move on to an evolved world of compassion and caring. It's up to us. And being angry and pointing fingers and finding fault, much fun as it is, uh, that's really not going to serve us and bring us into the kind of energy that we need to embrace, to evolve. And I think that's the message of Dolores Cannon's book. This is up to us. This is karmic lessons. This is free will choices. Um, those who can make that choice in a positive direction should start doing that now, <laughs> like yesterday. And... Some people simply won't be capable of it and we have to mind our own beeswax and try to lead by example. Oh, 
Well, it was a good book. I thought it was very interesting and very thought provoking. The whole issue of some beings being energy but no soul, that was a mind blower. But it's important to remember, if I understand correctly, that some beings may be without a soul and just be energy and really just be filler in the supporting cast of characters. But that's not an eternal damnation. That's this time around. And they'll go back and start over and who knows what will happen next. So very interesting. So I uh, have a, another very interesting book picked out for next week. It's another mind blower. And in the meantime, thank you for watching. Um, by the time you see this, I will have already, fingers crossed, um, recorded and uploaded my conversation with Professor Marcus Redeker of Benjamin Lay, the fearless Benjamin Lay. Finally, we're getting together. He's better. Our schedules are cleared. Fingers crossed. I'm, I'm filming this on Thursday because of work and stuff. I won't be uploading this until Saturday. And in the meantime, tomorrow, Friday, I will record my conversation with him and I will upload it. So I hope you find that. Seek it out. I think it'll, I think we're going to have fun. I'm hoping. Too bad I can't travel into the future. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much for watching. I really, really appreciate it. I hope you enjoyed the book. And uh, no end of books. I've gotten some great suggestions. And I've got a couple of books on order. So stay tuned. And in the meantime, Slanga Foil. Slancha.